Everything looks good. I see there's still some people joining. Welcome. Hopefully your audio is working well. I would like to emphasize that there is a question and answer tab at the top of your screen. Please do not hesitate to use this mechanism to type questions you may have at any time. Questions will be read and answered. Well, good day. Welcome to the Exeter Web Seminar on IEC 61508 Certification of Safety Equipment. My name is Bill Goebel. Uh, I am uh, Managing Director of uh, Exeter Certification um, in the United States. And uh, most of my background has been in new product development and equipment design, mostly electronic and software. Um, and so you, you can see that background reflected in the, in the presentation today. I work for Exeter. Exeter is a worldwide global corporation with offices around the world. Exeter has many different product and service categories, including product certification and personnel certification. Today, we're primarily going to be talking about product certification. Exeter also provides, has, has created, has developed a full set of safety lifecycle engineering tools from alarm management and process hazards analysis all the way through the safety life cycle down to proof test specification and operational data collection. These tools come in handy and clearly have a relationship uh, to the certification process, which I'll tell you about. Exeter is what I call a knowledge company. Exeter does a lot of research on safety and reliability. We do a lot of research on failure rate data. We develop many of the analysis methods used for safety evaluation. And I'm proud to say that Exeter publishes its work in publicly available books available on uh, the Exeter.com website. Some of them are available on the ISA.org website or the Amazon.com website. Now let's talk about functional safety certification. Certification is a third-party assessment done against a set of requirements. <coughs> Now, third party simply means you have someone who is quite impartial, and we'll talk about that later when it comes down to accreditation and how one becomes authorized to do certifications. But third party means an impartial assessment rather than a biased assessment. Certification should involve a very detailed analysis of the engineering process to determine systematic, what we call systematic capability, and of course, of the software and hardware design to make sure that the design itself is fundamentally safe. Authorization to do real certification comes from a national accreditation body. There's usually one or more accreditation bodies in each country of the world, at least each major country, and the accreditation body is typically a member of the uh, International Accreditation uh, Federation, and many countries, most countries around the world are signatories to the IAF, making an IAF accreditation recognized around the world. Exeter has been accredited by ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, 
and we were accredited per uh, <clears throat> ISO, IEC 17025, a standard for test laboratories, and uh, EN 45011, or guide, IEC guide 65, to be a certification body for a number of different functional safety standards. Every certification body should establish a scheme. Now, it's just a word that I read in one of these international standards, which describes what are you going to do? What requirements do you have for the manufacturer? And, of course, one must, the CB, must write down these requirements. And each CB may create their own scheme or may use someone else's scheme. An advisory board should be established to provide input on the certification scheme in order to make it effective for the particular market in which they operate. Any CB operating according to the accredited procedures will put the logo of the AB, the accreditation body, remember that term, accreditation body, that's AB. Any, when product certifications are done per the official accreditation, accredited procedures, CBs will put the accreditation body logo on their certificates. You can see in front of you uh, the corner of an Exodus certificate showing that this particular certification was done per our accredited procedures. Generally, that means we're following the full quality outline. Some companies do not follow their accredited procedures, even if they're accredited, and some companies are not even accredited. To find that out, quickly look at the certificate and look for a copy of the AB logo. Exeter has an advisory board as required by IEC Guide 65 because Exeter strives to operate the most useful and relevant product certification program in the world. It's absolutely a fact that Exeter has only been doing product certifications for about 12 years. Some of the others in the certification market, some of the other CBs have been operating for 20, 25. In fact, companies have been in existence for 100 years. Since Exeter is, in effect, the new guy on the block, we have to do a better job. And we work very hard to make the best certification program in the world, which I'll tell you a little bit about today. By the way, let me remind you again to do not hesitate. If you have any comments or questions, please type them in. I'll just double check. None right now. All right. In order to establish a useful and relevant product certification program, you have to do a couple things. Number one, you really need engineers out in the field performing work at the systems level. Exeter has them. Our people understand the problems of those who use certified equipment. Secondly, it's very important, in my mind at least, that we establish an advisory board to help identify problems and to make suggestions of how to build a better certification program. Exeter's advisory board consists of a large number of end-user and engineering company uh, personnel from around the world. We have meetings typically two or three times a year where issues are discussed and suggestions are made. Suggestions that have been made are approved, and Exeter enhances its program. Hey, I got a question. Thank you, Ali. Is safety equipment certification required to be mandatory? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we will be talking about it, but I'll give you an answer right now. IEC 61511 is very clear that all equipment must be justified, and you may use 
certification as a means to justify your equipment or any particular uh, end user may take responsibility for justifying their own equipment via the proven and used method. Exeter does have a complete webinar on this particular method because to me it, it's very important. That this, this equipment is very important. The whole concept of safety design is very important and you really need to do a good job making certain that all the equipment you select has matches your application and has sufficient safety integrity. But it is not mandated by 61511 and I believe and it's very clear that it's not mandated by 61508 either. But it sure makes life easier and I'll be explaining that toward the end. Given our advisory board and our need to establish the most relevant and useful certification scheme in the world, our, the Exodus certification scheme has requirements that go beyond 61508. One of the reasons for that is very simple. 61508 was, the, the, the last portion of 61508 was released in 2000. An update in spite of the hard work of many committee members, an update was not completed until 2010. Based on that history, we could expect perhaps another update into 2020. Quite frankly, the world changes faster than that. Our knowledge improves at a faster rate than once every 10 years. And so Exeter has established a certification scheme that's far more up-to-date. Exeter does FMEDA analysis. It's an, well, an accurate failure mode predictive technique developed by Exeter based on 100 billion hours of field failure data. Data from Exeter is dependable. Exeter publishes a full set of failure rates, not just PFD average, the way other certification bodies do. And that's so you can deal with the variables that impact PFD average from site to site. Yes, there are. We have a whole seminar on that also. Exida and that analyzes and publishes false trip data, the safe failure rates, so that you can evaluate false trip potential of any given safety instrumented function or collection of safety instrumented functions. That's important in the process industries. I don't know if your company cares about a false trip, but many of the ones I've worked for really care about a false trip. Many certification bodies do not require the manufacturers to publish false trip data. Exeter does. Exeter deals with maintainability and design complexity. We evaluate those, and we use them as inputs to our calculation tool. We evaluate cybersecurity. Of course, the world of cybersecurity is changing very rapidly. Exeter is actually in the forefront of that change. Given several people who are active committee and chairman of several of the various cybersecurity for control systems committees. Exeter requires a practical proof test. I've had a lot of field experience that makes me doubt how well proof testing is being done in the field. And therefore, it's essential that easy to implement proof tests be part of a product certification. This is not part of every CB certification. And lastly, Exeter does surveillance audits, which I'll explain. We periodically check to make sure a product is still safe. Take a look at this drawing. It, it appears a little complex, but the essence of it is pretty simple. At Exeter, we analyze the process. How does a manufacturer create and test a new product? How do they write the software? How do they test the software? 
And what is the user documentation? We analyze the software, de the hardware design, the systems level design, and the software design. We analyze any communication protocols for cybersecurity and for safety. We document all of this in a safety case, a technique developed, actually, the paper I read indicates it was developed by the British military um, a few decades ago as a thorough and complete way to make sure a product meets all the requirements. All of this analysis is documented in an FMEDA EA report, an FMEDA report, a felt injection test, detailed sheets, software hazard reports, communications reports, and finally, if the safety case, if all requirements are met, an independent auditor checks the safety case and issues a certificate and an assessment report which we require to be publicly available documents uh, in one way or another. For the most part, I will be telling you that certificates and the assessment report, which is an important part, are available on the Exeter website. Don't forget, you can ask questions. Now, this looks complicated, and it looks tough. And I'll bet you if you work for a manufacturer right now, you're looking at it and think, oh, my goodness, that's a lot of work. And to a certain extent, it is. But it's what's necessary to make sure your product, your complex product, is safe. Now, there's obviously a lot less work if you have a simple product. I, I, uh, I could call it dumb, but I could call it non-smart, or I could simply say there's no software. So obviously all software-related things are not required. However, the design process and the test process and the user documentation is still an important part of certification, even for a simple device like a solenoid valve. We still do a detailed failure mode effect analysis, a failure mode effect and diagnostic analysis so one can publish the failure rates and failure modes and false trip rates. And we still do a full safety case before a certificate is issued. The certification analysis can be summed up by saying the certification body looks at the design, testing, and documentation process. The certification body audits data storage and smart devices. Data protection is needed. The certification body analyzes a manufacturer's product diagnostics because there are minimum levels of requirements for diagnostic coverage. Exeter, as a certification body, does a detailed component level failure impact analysis, the FMEDA, which generates failure rates as a function of failure modes, safe and dangerous. The manufacturing process quality is audited, and the end user documentation is audited. So why do you want to buy a certified product? Because an impartial third party has thoroughly looked at all of these things. Is it practical for an end user to go audit all of this for every manufacturer? Many have told me it's completely impractical. That's why the certification is becoming so popular. For example, pressure transmitters have been certified now for about 10 years. Yokogawa, Honeywell, Rosemount, and many others have certified pressure transmitters. And temperature level, flow. It's amazing to me how many products are now available in a certified version. The development process, how they create the process was audited, how they have ensured the safety of the product was audited in detail. They've typically added features to detect any software execution problems. They've typically added automatic diagnostics to achieve diagnostic coverage levels. An FMEDA analysis is done and the end user and the end user manuals are studied. I got another question. Thank you so much. How 
should users request the false trip rate of suppliers? I paraphrased a little bit. Um, you need, I'll, I'll show you uh, the, the data sets that are typical on the Exodus certificate. And if your supplier is using an Exodus uh, sort of is using Exeter as the certification body, you will get the false trip failure rates. If your manufacturer is using uh, another certification body, you may or may not get the false uh, trip rate. Uh, most of the certification bodies in Germany uh, don't seem to think that's important. Exeter does. And I'll show you an example of the kind of uh, information you should be getting. Um, you should most certainly ask your manufacturer for the dangerous failure rates and the safe failure rates. Because we're trying to protect against both random and systematic failures. Even a solenoid valve has value if it's solenoid. Because the design process is audited. The testing results are audited. The end user documentations are audited, and a detailed failure mode effect and diagnostic analysis is done, verified by fault injection testing. Yes, you can simulate failures even in a solenoid valve and a field failure study. That gives you relatively accurate. And I say relatively because in general, uh, we have a whole web seminar on comparing failure rate data. And there are some data that's being published today that is just dangerously low, which I'll talk to you about for just a moment. We cover both random and systematic failures because those are the two fundamental principles of IEC 61508. Actuators and valves have been certified. A lot of people ask, now hold it. Mechanical parts aren't part of 61508. Yes, they are. They're part of a safety system, and there is a clear statement that says this includes all parts of a safety instrument and function that has electrical, electronic, or programmable electronic components. And again, same as solenoid valves, we look at the design process. We look at the testing results. We do a detailed FMEDA analysis that provides reliable accurate failure rate data, and we look at user documentation. And of course, because we want to cover both systematic and random failures. Even logic solvers, the, whole, the place where certification program, uh, the whole certification concept began. I don't know if any of you are nearly as old as I am, but I remember back in the mid-80s when there was a huge argument about whether one could even use a programmable system uh, as a safety logic solver, as opposed to relays, which were commonly used at the time. Because one of the problems with a relay-based approach is the false trip rate. And today, the fault-tolerant logic solvers made by many different manufacturers including in the case of Exeter, uh, Emerson Process Automation, Rockwell, and Honeywell all have had their logic solver products uh, certified by Exeter. And again, we look for both random and systematic protection, which involves auditing their process, auditing their design, looking at their test results, doing a detailed FMEDA analysis, and looking at their end-user documentation. I see another question. Thank you so much. Can we use the vendor's declaration instead of a third-party certificate? Oh, thanks for asking that question. When I audit a systems-level job, or anyone at Exeter in the Exeter Systems Group, we will not accept a vendor's declaration or calculation of data. There's what I consider some highly strong reasons for this. And the first reason, I'm afraid, is a tale I will tell you. Exit audited a manufacturer per IEC 61508. They failed very badly. And I cannot mention the name because 
were under a non-disclosure. We sent the failure report to the manufacturer, and three months later, that manufacturer issued their own vendor's declaration of suitability for safety integrity level three. I was appalled. I contacted the management of the company, but nothing was ever done, indicating to me that there are some companies that simply cannot be trusted. Now, I don't know that every company cannot be trusted, but I have learned to be extremely skeptical. And there's two reasons, besides the fact that some companies have a strong incentive to sell their products. I've also discovered that even those companies with high integrity don't have the technical knowledge and the depth of technical expertise to even thorough, to, to sufficiently understand 61508. I have seen, and you got to remember, if you remember my background a little bit, I used to work for a manufacturer. I was taught how to calculate failure rates based on manufacturer's warranty data, and I can simply tell you that that kind of data is highly optimistic and therefore dangerous. I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Thanks so much for asking. I think I get a little passionate about that. Yes, I think safety is very important. And we cannot promote, we cannot even allow. I wish I could do something about some of the problems I see, but I'm under non-disclosure. We cannot allow unsafe practices. My job is to tell you about them so you can be on the lookout. Now I talked about the exit of, the extra things that are part of the exit of certification scheme. We do an FMEDA analysis. FMEDA is an analysis of the design. It's a clear analysis of design strength. Because it's a procedure where you look at every single component of a design, mechanical or electronic. If you're talking about mechanical, we look at the seal, we look at the housing, we look at the obturator. That's a term I learned from our mechanical engineers, the, the thing that actually blocks the flow in this particular triple offset butterfly valve. Uh, it's the thing in the middle of the picture. Every part, how can that part fail? If it, a part fails in that particular way, how does that impact the instrument? Does that cause a false trip? Does it cause a fail danger? Does it cause some other failure mode? So you can see, if we're looking at every single part, it's a very detailed and thorough examination. The FMEDA technique was invented by a group of engineers who are now part of Exeda. We obviously believe very much in it. And one of the primary reasons is because gathering enough of failure statistics at the process level has simply not happened. There is not enough data to give us the information we need to do systems level design. Therefore, using a component database, the failure rates and failure modes for a product can be determined far more accurately than with any manufacturer's field failure data. And I will say that many of the certification bodies do not use the FMEDA technique. I'm not even confident some of them know what it is. But Exeter does. Of course, the problem, the real problem is if you have bad component data, you're not going to have good, you're going to have bad product data. Therefore, it's very, very important that FMEDAs uh, component data be calibrated by field failure data. And at Exeter, we have accumulated over the last 15 years, actually over the last uh, 30 years, because people at Exeter have been gathering field failure data for decades. We've gathered over 100 billion unit hours of field data from the process industries. And we use this data to feed back and to generate the component failure database which is publicly available, 
and uh, provides the basis of our analysis. We also, of course, compare FMEDA results frequently with actual field failure data. Here's a comparison of a solenoid valve. The FMEDA results for a simple design versus a complex design, and FMEDA number one here was a poppet type solenoid valve, and FMEDA number two was a spool valve. It was a, um, a 3 2 a spool valve with pretty high airflow, CV airflow capacity. Um, it was a much larger valve, it was more complicated because clearly because of the number of O-rings, whereas the poppet type was a much simpler design, and it had a much lower failure rate, roughly 2 times e to the minus 7, that's failures per hour, versus 6. When we compared that with the Dow Chemical Plant study uh, done in 2008, the Dow data is right in the middle. Take a look at that on the screen. I traveled to the Netherlands and discussed this issue. I was told by the analysts at Dow that their data includes all types of solenoid valves, puppets and spools and everything else. And quite frankly to me, that's wonderful. Because if I take the average of the FMEDA results, it matches almost perfectly with the Dow data. Even when I look at ORETA, the Offshore Reliability Equipment Database, it has a number that's higher, and that's that yellow dot up here. And that's, that's not a bad match, uh, but it's about twice as high as the Exeter data depends on which piece of data you use and exactly what kind of, of, of solenoid valve they're talking about. Uh, but I have traveled to Norway and attended technical conferences where these issues were debated. I think we do have a good explanation of why it's different, but that's a whole uh, different web seminar, so we can't get into that today. I will tell you that failure rate data based on cycle testing and manufacturer's warranty data is highly optimistic and dangerously low. Take a look at those last three entries. Manufacturers typically classify failures differently than reality. I'm not confident I call them impartial. I was taught not <laughs> I was taught to do that when I worked for a manufacturer. Cycle test results, while they may be valid for machine safety and applications where solenoids are frequently moving, they are not at all applicable to process industry applications where failure modes are due to stiction, corrosion, um, binding, and cold welding dominate. So be very wary of manufacturer's results given to you by the vendor based on their warranty return data. And here's a comparison that shows you why. That data is dangerously too low. In the Exeter Certification Scheme, we publish failure rates, not just PFD average, because there are many variables involved in calculating PFD average. And we analyze and publish the false trip data. <coughs> you can see that if you look at the back page of virtually every single Exeter certificate. Our certificates are available on the Exeter website. And I'll tell you again later why you should be checking that. We publish and require that manufacturers publish a full set of failure rate data, including both failure, both safe and dangerous failure rate, because it allows you, the designer, to not only calculate your PFD average based on the variables in your plant, 
but it also allows you to calculate the false trip rate, which is awfully important to most of us in the process industries. Excellent evaluates maintainability and design complexity, which have everything to do with, actually they're kind of the same thing. Design complexity has a lot to do with maintainability. Many of you thoroughly understand that. Some products are really hard to calibrate, and some are very, very easy. A product that's hard to calibrate and maintain will probably have more maintenance-induced failures. Exeter evaluates that and includes it in our model. In the Exeter Excellentia tool, one variable to calculate PEFT average is maintenance-induced failures. It involves probabilities of successful repairs, probabilities of successful proof tests, and probabilities of doing proof tests on schedule. You may use this model to actually model the specific maintenance conditions of your specific products in your specific site. Many people can take full advantage of this uh, to get lower PFD average numbers and higher sill levels. Or, if in fact you have very poor maintenance capability, I have, we have one client who used this to justify uh, beefing up their maintenance capabilities. Exida does a cybersecurity audit, <laughs> and I have to say, if applicable, uh, because we honestly did not do a cybersecurity audit on a solenoid valve. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to uh, be totally ridiculous, but it's mostly the smart products that have um, Ethernet connections. And one of the reasons, I mean, you might ask, well, why are you doing that? 61508 doesn't talk about that. Well, it does have one sentence in part one. I can't remember the number right now. I have to look it up in our book. But if there is a... a, a I can't remember the right word. A credit, that's it. Credible cybersecurity threat. Then you must do a threat analysis and take proper mitigation actions. Wow. It's very clear to virtually everybody in the world today, especially based, especially after Stuxnet and the Saudi Aramco attack, that cybersecurity threats are credible. We audit cybersecurity, and Exeter is a very active in cybersecurity committees. There are basically two accredited security product certifications available today. The first is based on the uh, ISO IEC 62443 set of standards, and the second is based on the ANSI ISA EDSA 300 series of standards known as ISA Secure. Uh, Exeter is accredited. Uh, by ANSI and ASQ to perform, uh, and by ISCI to perform the ISA secure certifications, and by ANSI to, su to supply the 16443 certifications. It involves understanding how the product is developed. I mean, much, much like functional safety, how the product is developed, uh, what features are in the product to to uh, to provide defenses against cybersecurity attack. And there is a communications robustness testing. It's physical testing of, uh, of the networks to make sure that network overload will not impact the safety function. Of course, the criteria is it, it must continue to provide a safety function uh, under full load communication testing, or it will specify a level at which it no longer passes. A practical proof test is required. I spent a lot of time in the field, at least, well, perhaps maybe you don't think it's a lot of time. Those of you who are experts uh, in, in, in process industry operations, which I am not, but I have had the opportunity to go out and spend a week or two here and there um, doing proof testing with end-user customers from around the world. And several of the Exeter people are heavily involved in establishing and actually helping execute proof tests. And what we're discovering is that some of the proof testing 
especially the, quote, functional testing of an entire loop, is terribly time-consuming. And actually, when you analyze it, it, it often, many of the tests don't do anything more than the automatic diagnostics built into the equipment do. To me, that's just a waste of time. So at Exeter, we work on far more optimal proof testing, and uh, we put examples of proof tests uh, in our FMEDA report, and we publish the diagnostic coverage of that proof testing. Surveillance audits. Exit initiated the program of putting in expiration dates on our certificates. Look at that little, I've got a little, uh, I've got a blow up of a section of the front page of an exit of certificate, and it's valid for a maximum of three years. At that time, why? Why do we have this on there? I mean, first of all, people say, well, if I bought one, do I have to rip it out? Well, no, this is a design audit, and uh, most manufacturers will renew their certificate. But what happens? Exeter goes out and asks them, did you make any engineering changes, especially any engineering change that would impact safety? And we'd like to take a look at those. We'd like to make sure you properly, you maintained your level of design quality and your level of testing. And we'd like to take a look at your actual field failure data. Have you had any failures? What kind of failures were they? And we compare those analysis to the FMEDA results constantly looking for any unknown failure modes. We review their process changes. Uh, we had one company that changed their process to add in the proper level of testing and demonstrated to us that, that they performed that testing and we gave them a certificate. And then as soon as we gave them a certificate, they went back and removed all of that from their process. A management guy came along and said, oh, this costs too much. Let's get rid of that. You think I'm kidding? This is a real story. But we found out. We did a surveillance audit. We said, let me, let me check your, we need to check your procedures. And we saw a change. And we saw exactly what they did. And said, this is not good. Obviously, that's grounds to withdraw the certificate. And, uh, or they must reinstitute and retest every engineering change since the initial. That was terribly expensive, but in this case, they chose to do it because this particular company, in my mind, has had a lot of integrity. But wouldn't you think it's important that you go out and ask these questions? Is your product still safe? Just because you got a certificate four years ago or ten years ago, is the product still safe? Did you do anything to screw it up? Anybody that's ever been involved in product development knows that's probably more likely than we'd all like to admit. Exeter initiated a surveillance audit program which is not typically done by all certification bodies. I will tell you that when I work for a manufacturer, we had a product that was certified. There was never a surveillance audit ever done. And I thought, this is very strange. Anyway, surveillance audits are an important thing that Exit added directly as a result of feedback from our advisory board. All Exeter certificates uh, done since we became accredited uh, several years ago are published on the safety automation element list. It's important that if you get a copy of an Exeter certificate, or, or even a TUV certificate for that matter, look on the safety automation element list and see if it's valid. Why would I say something like that? 
Well, I'm sorry that such things exist in the world, but every year we get one or two forged certificates. Yes. Yes. Forged certificate. A manufacturer gets an electronic screen capture of our certificates and then edits it to delete the name of the company that actually got the certificate and put in their name. What are they doing? Well, they're cheating. They want to sell. The customer wants certified product for good reason. Always check the safety automation equipment list. I had to hit that a little hard because I got three forged certificates just last week. Exeter has a mechanism so that you can detect this. It's called the safety automation element list. All you have to do is go online and look. In fact, after this webinar, go on and take a look. You'd be amazed at how many products are actually certified. For example, I didn't expect you to read all this, but I want you to see that how many different ball valves are available from many different customers on the market. Virtually all the mechanical products in the world have been certified by Exeter since we have developed the, uh, many of the techniques used to certify mechanical products. But take a look how many are available. That's exactly the kind of a thing you'll see on the safety automation element list. Even logic solvers, the place where all of this started. Exit has an excellent list of all, certifi all certified logic solvers uh, that we are aware of. Of course, manufacturers who are not part of the Exit certification program must give us permission uh, to list their name, and not all of them have. And not all of them have given permission uh, to post their certificates or their certification reports. But we will still list any product that we know about that was done uh, with an accredited certification program. You'll see many of these are part of, are, are some of the TUV organizations from Germany, TUF Sud, TUF Nord, TUF Rhineland. Uh, all three of those organizations uh, are active in creating certificates. I'm very proud that Exit has done certification projects for most major automation companies around the world, and that in the process industries, Exeter is the leader. We've done more certificates than anyone in the world. Oh, I've got some challenges there. Thank you. Good. Is the SAEL maintained by Exeter or any public regulatory body? SAEL is maintained by Exeter. We keep it far more up to date than all my experience for any public or regulatory body. But you must remember that the SAEL is an essential part of our accredited certification program, and Exeter is regularly audited, at least once a year, by the American National Standards Institute, the ISA signatory uh, to, excuse me, the IEC signatory organization for the United States. I feel far more confident about the credibility and accuracy of the information on the safety automation equipment list than I do for any other uh, agency in the world. <coughs> Thanks for asking. Oh, I'm getting a lot of questions. This is good. I love challenges. Oh, there's a tough one. Thank you, Ellie. Is there any motor starter or contactor being certified by Exeter? That's been a big issue. Last summer, uh, Exeter did an audit of several jobs, and obviously there was a requirement in, in, in many safety functions to turn off a pump. Obviously, most safety functions involve removing energy uh, from a process. And the motor starter and the motor contactor is an important part of that 
an important part of that safety function. What we discovered at the time was there were virtually none available on the market, and I would have to tell you, I'm not aware of any certified uh, motor starters or contactors uh, on the market even today. However, um, yeah, I can say this. I, I have to be careful about the non-disclosures, but there are definitely uh, motor starters in the process of being certified. So stay tuned. Watch the safety automation equipment list because Exodus, I think last year we did over 60 product certifications. And this year I think we'll do even more. But if we're doing on an average one a week, you would expect to see new products in many different categories. Got another question. Thank you. What is there gas detectors available? Well, the answer is yes. Um, look on the safety automation element list, and you'll see uh, flame detectors. You'll see gas detectors. Uh, of course, the, 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 there are many certified gas detectors. Follow-up question. If you know, there, there is an ISA TR report, technical report on fire and gas, and there, there is an, an accurate statement that sometimes you cannot depend on flammable or toxic gas detectors out in the open air because you never know which way the wind is going to blow. So when you have such applications, why bother with certification? Well, if you're taking credit for risk reduction, and you may choose to take credit or not for such systems, that's part of your system's level design and, and your, process, uh, your, your process risk analysis. If you take credit then you should be designing per IEC 61511, and you'll be needing to justify your equipment. And it's, it's, it's a good idea. It's, it's, an e it's easy to justify equipment with a certified piece of equipment. And remember, there are many applications in more confined spaces where there's no wind blowing, and these sensing devices can provide very uh, important risk reduction factors. Well, the bottom line from our perspective is that certification has a lot of benefits. It's not mandatory from 61511 or 61508, but for the end user, you get clear safety integrity justification for the selection of your equipment. You know this equipment has been independently evaluated by a third party. If it's an Exodus certification, you get good predictive failure rate data, which compares pretty much right on the money with field failure data from the process industries, chemical, petrochemical, offshore, and even sub-sea. You get good predictive failure rate data, which allows you to do a proper system design. And... Exeter is very fussy about the safety manuals and the documentation provided to help you, the end user, do your systems level designs. If you are a manufacturer, you want certification so you can have a third party demonstration of the high design and manufacturing quality. Now, I don't mean to imply for a minute that a manufacturer who does not have certification is not producing high quality. I know some manufacturers who passed the Exodus certification audit with relative ease. And it was totally obvious to me they already had a very high design and manufacturing quality. But now I can attest to that, having audited their processes. Often, when we certify a product, we discover design flaws because the requirements for the design process in 61508 are pretty tough. That means there's a reduced field failure rate and a substantially reduced life cycle cost. A 
manufacturer will get market recognition with an Exeter certificate because Exeter is globally recognized as the premier certification body in the process industries and we've done more process industry certifications than any other certification body. And lastly, we, Exeter provides market support. Products are placed with data into the Excellentia tool. Products are placed onto the safety automation equipment list, giving exposure to those uh, who look there for certified equipment, which is quite a few. Now, don't forget, I wanted to explain what we do, what is the process, so if you're an end user, you can understand. I wanted to explain how tough it is if you're a manufacturer, not to scare you, but to help you recognize the value. I hope we've achieved that in our webinar today. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask. If you have questions later, please do not hesitate to send me an email. I've just typed my email address. I did want to let you know that a set of these slides and a recording of this web seminar will be available um, through the Exeter website uh, <clears throat> within a few days. So if you wanted to take notes or if you wanted a copy of the slides, please check in. And if you don't get what you want, please let us know. I want to thank all of you for your attention.